Hi. Uh, well, first off, I just want to say, uh, in high school, I didn't have a social life, and the reason why I'm here is because I listened to basically all your releases. So uh, thank you for thank that. Thank you. And uh, so my question is uh, actually kind of tied into the iTunes era, but more so, it seems like at this point, um, indie, at least on a superficial level, start to take off, and the sense of like the OC and like you know like I uh, mentioned like obviously Arcade Fire, but you also had like Modest Mouse and uh, Def Cap like getting big, and like um, last year like I was watching uh, Veronica Mars, and uh, at the end of the episode, there's Kristen Bell doing a voiceover, being like. You can buy Spoon, Give Me Fiction right now on Merge Records, which is uh, which was really funny to me. But so this also, is a rerun, right? This is like this is really old. This, yeah, it's old. And uh, so, like, my question is, like, like how did that happen? It's like right? a tattoo. <laughs> like, um, with kind of like the streaming era being like the the driving force uh, right now. Do you still see like, uh, like that kind of like exposure, in the sense of like the OC or or like Veronica Mars or like that kind of sh that kind of shift towards uh, TV or or mainstream culture as a sense kind of like promoting indie music that you had like some part in putting out? Do you still see that now, or is it kind of does it work in a different way? It doesn't work the same way it did in that time. Like that show you saw that was in a time like this, and also a golden age in sync placements, um, where there was a lot more money in broadcast media, basically, where those people had more money to spend on getting songs, or, or that they were willing to spend on putting songs in their shows. Um, and Sometimes you would trade some part of what they were supposed to pay you for like a card at the end, like they called it a card, um, at the end of the pro show where they would either say who the band was and where you could get the record or um, there would be like a visual thing. Um, but anyway, that, that era has also ended now there's still, you know, they still want music to be in shows, but they're not willing to pay as much for it. Um, and it doesn't seem to have the same impact that it used to. You know, it used to be if you had a song in a commercial, it meant that that record was going to, it would give that record a boost, and it doesn't so much anymore. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this question's for both of you, I guess. Um, I'm just wondering, as a big fan of both your labels, I'm wondering if there was a single band you wish that you signed, whether you didn't get to them in time or you were working to sign. Is there a, a white whale band out there that both of you have wish, wish you could have gotten your hands on 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever? What was the, what was the biggest selling record of the last, like, 20 years? <laughs> um, people, people used never to ask mind. Me. Well, so yeah, I mean, people. Or do, was that more than twenty? That was years. more. That was thirty. That's what I'm saying. Like BTS, or like people do. It's funny. People ask me that question a lot. I used. To, I used. I mean, and I've I've always given a kind of similar answer. You know, I used to say like Thriller or the Beatles or something because I would have an extra couple tens to twenty million dollars, but then I then I could keep putting out. You know, whatever. Um, whatever obscure more, punk yeah, rock I, records. I could spend you more do. putting out. I mean, it would so it would make my life easier, but um, in the sense of having like a big cash cow, but. At least for me personally, like there's never felt like something like one that got away because it's it feels more like we're like on a collision course with each other and the artists. I'm I'm not usually going after artists. I, I don't think I've ever really gone after an artist. It's always felt like um, okay, we've known each other for a long time. I've been seeing this band play a long time. Maybe I saw them or met them when they were like 14 coming to shows and now they're 18 starting their first band or something or like they've kind of been around and so it just it, it never. For me, it never was like I was trying to go after a band. So the only good answer I do have is like it'd be cool to you know put out like a Beyonce record and just have that in the catalog and you know making me some money. But I don't know. How about you? Is you is it different? Or? Uh, 
It's funny, the band that pops into my head when you ask that question is this band called The Black Kids. And um, I, it, what's funny about it is that like, you know, we passed on them actually the first time around. And then like, like yeah, we passed on them. And, and it's not like they've had great success since then. And they kind of fell apart, it seems like. But they definitely, like, I just appreciate them or appreciate some of their songs and their goofiness and like how, like, and I just wonder what would have happened if their, de if their, their route had been different? Like where would they be now? Would they still be a band? Would they be a better band? Like th there's these different things that happen based on like just circumstances, you know? Like if I hadn't worked at Pepper's Pizza, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, so, like, if we had signed the black kids, what would those people be doing now? Um, like, right now, like, Reggie from the black kids moved to Athens, Georgia, and works at a record store. And, I don't know, I, I feel it's, it, yeah, you it like, makes me a little sad. Yeah, I mean, I always have the opposite. I, there's a lot of bands I've passed on that have gotten, like, really successful, but it's funny, I never, when I look back, I'm like, yeah, I, I still, I'm glad they're successful. I still yeah. don't think they would have, I don't think I would have worked with them. Like, it's, it, it, I would have, yeah. I would have said no. If I knew how successful they would have been, I would have said no again, because it's not always about, like, putting out the biggest. Yeah. It's like what fits. So I've never yeah, really Yeah, it is about way. what I've fits. Really but also, there's, we've passed on a lot of bands or, or just not gotten bands, and it's fine because we can't put everything out. Yeah. And like, thank God we don't try because it doesn't work if you try to put out too many records. You don't have enough, like we only, we only have so much time and energy. Yeah, there's a lot of times I, I tell artists no and I say I really, really like your band. I can't do it right now and I do genuinely mean it. And then like, I go, I go our, buy their record. Our release schedule is booked through the, until like next February. Yeah, but I'll go buy their record. I'll see them whenever they're in town and then I'll be like, look, I'm, your, I'm, I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm a really big fan. I just I couldn't do it. I still can't do it, but I'll go buy your record on the label you find. And I think some people um, think that's like a like a blowing them off, like I'm too busy right now, but it's really not. Like, um, I usually, I, I usually, I've learned it's not good to be to, to be disingenuous like that because um, it's better to just be honest. But so, but then when I do tell someone I I'm too busy, I usually really mean it, and um, and sometimes they don't believe me, but then I'm at their show, and then they're like, oh wow, you really did like the record, you know? So. Hello. Uh, first off, I'd just like to thank you for not passing on Spoon it before Girls Can Tell came out and for changing your oh, mind man. about that. Oh, man. Because that band has changed my life. Um, I also have, a, I have your book with me, um, or the one that you did interviews in. Uh, but I have to go very shortly. I just wanted to get this question out. So uh, some of my favorite bands are Spoon, Arcade Fire, um, this artists like Destroyer, people that have been on your label. So in those years, in the 2000s, when a lot of those bands came into fruition, besides their music just being really unique and something that gravitated, or just had something like this gravitational impact on people, um, what did you guys do at Merge to really get their music out there besides maybe like them touring and pushing sync? Really, like, we, we have good people working for us and, you know, a good publicity team, a good radio person, um, and, and a good retail team, too. And, like, I think that all those things together work, are, you know, part of what it takes to support a band um, and help make them successful, but really like a lot, so much of it is the band and the band being willing to work hard um, and tour like Spoon has um, and, um, you know, be out there and, and be their own face, you know? Um, yeah, Spoon. They're a great band. I wish Britt Daniel was my dad, but <laughs> it just, life hasn't really worked out like that for me. No. I'm sorry about the whole thing that happened with the catalog. Yeah, me too. Me too. It really bums me out. 
Um, don't get me started. I won't. I didn't or we're, we'll go right down the Bummersville Road again. Good band. Good band. Yes. Yeah, I heard both of you refer to the, the sort of iTunes download era as being a really great thing that, that where everybody made a lot of money. And that was really surprising to me. I'd never quite heard anybody talk about it in that way. Um, I always sort of saw that as the era of piracy and the, and the beginning and the end sort of thing. Um, so... How long was it? Was that a real factor for you? The the piracy, did that, did that really cut into your profits, or was that kind of was it only when the um, streaming came that everything went downhill? It may uh, piracy may have cut into our profits, but we didn't notice. I think you piracy know? was I think piracy was great for independent labels. I think what piracy did was it made it hard for major labels to push the stuff they used to be able to push, and so people were actually hearing the the independent label stuff at a rate they didn't used to hear it when it was all locked down by and the radio. And also, piracy it, was not for everyone. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, not everyone was gonna go to one of those sites and BitTorrent what. <laughs> and and download something under their computer that might have a virus or you know might not who knows you know like I mean, I my mom was not going to do that only certain kind of geeky people felt comfortable doing that I think and it was a, a subculture more than a People wanted an easier, more legit way to do it, and they were willing to pay 99 cents to do it, I think. Yeah, but also before piracy, like, like the majors had a really efficient marketing system where they could hire a bunch of producers and video directors and songwriters to make a really, really good song and then package it on an expensive album with like 16 other songs that sounded nothing like it and were terrible. And so you'd go and you would, you would buy it, and you'd be really, it was awful, but, but yet you, you were already purchased it, and then with piracy, you could hear the whole thing, and you knew it was awful, and then you would hear an entire Neutral Milk Hotel record, and you were like, wait, this is a whole record, start to finish, that's good. Wait, all these independent, and it actually made it really easy for independent artists and labels to compete, what they never could before, and I think piracy only really threatened the majors, and they were losing money because they were losing the control they used to have. They used to be able to put stuff on end caps and on radio, and they had more spaces that you couldn't compete with them, and piracy was a space where we could compete equally. And I think then when you can compete equally with the majors, the quality rose to, rose to the top. And I think then people are also still buying music and they were buying a lot of merge records, you know? And I think, it was a, I think it was a lot of that story, which is, it's told, but it's not told as much as a story of everyone was stealing music and now bad bands that were making a lot of money couldn't make money. But it was more that it was exposing how bad they were. You could see there was much easier to sell low quality things in a in a pre-piracy era. Hello, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I went to school here a, a bunch of years ago and I read the Merge book when I was a sophomore and it changed how I thought about everything and I, I wish that when I was going to school here there was someone like Joe who could bring Laura, you to come here. Um, question I have, having started a label then, it was hard to not feel envy of labels who came way before when digital and then streaming happened, thinking about successful catalog titles, where we have, uh, you know, it, it felt like it rained on a successful release, and then you had digital, where these releases that you've long recouped had success again, and then streaming even more success again once everything um, was already presumably paid off. And I'm curious if there was a real impact there as you saw these successful records kind of continue to have financial success after you thought the door had kind of been closed there. For, I guess streaming is works out okay for bigger records, not so much for little catalog, you know? Um, often I feel like 
the amount of time you have to take to do the accounting to figure out how much money a little record has made. You have already spent more time in man, you know, more dollars in man hours than it was worth to figure it out. Um, than you earned, you know, like. Um, but the it works out for the bigger records, so it's good for the big bands, but not the little bands, um, and the the big catalog, not the little catalog. I'm kind of in between the two eras, I guess, because I remember also, I felt envy for the CD era because um, I came in just at the end of it. But then I think the one thing to remember is that that era also crushed a lot of labels. What year did you start your label? 2003, but I was doing, and I was doing vinyl for, um, I wasn't even doing CDs for a while because they weren't cool. Um, just kidding. <laughs> but You're not. <laughs> that was for, you, little, that was for you guys. They're like you know? coasters. <laughs> no, I love put CDs. Your I think they're drinks great on. Now. But at the time, I didn't think they were cool. But, um... But, but I think the thing to remember is just as much as a, I also felt this envy, like, man, if I, was only, if I only put this same record out like six years earlier, I would have made like $100,000, and now I made $10,000, which is... But there's no guarantee you would have made it. There's that. Anything. There's, you exactly. can put out the best record in the world, and nobody cares. That's what it turns out. It's all dumb, <laughs> random luck it really as is. to whether people notice your awesome record. And I think that's something that we talked about earlier tonight. A lot of our industry is dumb random luck, and there's some sort of you know snake oil salesmen that are willing to take credit for the happenings of the randomness. Like they think that yeah, they act like they can guarantee this. yeah that th this is a great record, and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna make everything happen for you. But that nobody can guarantee. Yeah, the that. truth is, and you probably feel the same way. You have the same people working on all of your records, and some of them do really and I doing the same things, and I do the same things, and some of them in my records. And, and and the truth is, if I could pick the ones that we're gonna that we're gonna do well, I'd actually pick different people. I have artists that would could really use some success, and um, they deserve it, and they could really use the money. And I can't get them the success, and I don't because it's completely random, and their records are absolutely fantastic. And I have other bands that seem to just like f fall into a really successful record. I'm like, you didn't really work very hard. I mean, records are still good, but I'm like, you didn't really. You just made a great, and so you you can't predict it. But but some people will take credit, and they'll go back and they'll say, well, I actually made this record big. I discovered this. I did these things, and I think the really smart people are like yourself that are willing to admit that it's random and then you learn how to be resilient in a random environment you know and that's why i think one of your labels been able to be so successful is the labels that think they're in control of randomness will eventually fall and the ones that realize it's random and build resilient strategies will succeed so. uh, we'll give time for one one more question here but then we will we will answer your questions all night in the in the well maybe not all night but in the uh, in the foyer there will be a reception with some some food and drink as long as someone didn't come and clean them up while we were in here um, so please stick around but um, this will be the last question for here so uh, first off congrats on thirty years thank you um, you were talking about some of the successes and it sounds like whether it was sixty nine love songs or funeral um, some of them were kind of unexpected. Were there ever times... I think all of them were. <laughs> were, there, were there ever times that you felt like ill-prepared or kind of unequipped for that success, and how did you deal with it? I think I already talked about <laughs> how ill-prepared we were <laughs> for both 69 Love Songs and Funeral. Totally ill-prepared, right? Like, we thought we would sell many fewer than we did, and we didn't make enough, and then we had to scramble to keep up with the demand. Um, like now I feel like I have to come up with more of them. Those are like the most striking examples though, for sure. Um, of run, like runaway trains kind of, you know? Um, I, 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 don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Like, the funeral example and the magnetic fields example are really like the worst ones. Or the best ones. Or the best ones, yeah. We can do one more question maybe since that was a short one. Um, hi, so you mentioned college radio I think two or three times uh, towards the beginning and uh, 
I know at WKDU, there's pretty much every DJ has at least one artist from Merge that they love, and pretty much every CD we get, we add immediately. Thank you. <laughs> so I was wondering uh, what role you think college radio played in, uh, this could actually go for both of you, like what role college radio played um, in like getting your company off the ground and how that role has shifted from then until now? Uh, particularly in the early days, I mean, still, I'd say, we rely a lot on college radio to play our records and help us reach a certain group of people. Um, and it's, it's a big part of it. And right, I don't know if right now it's less of a big part than it was, partly because people are now, thanks to streaming, I know, I shouldn't say thanks, but um, thanks to streaming, people are, are more, better able to sort of like check things out on their own where it used to be college radio was more likely to be their exposure to stuff that they hadn't heard and maybe didn't even know they wanted to hear. Um, we were talking about uh, playlists earlier on like Spotify and how I was noticing that, you know, there's these playlists that they, that, that they propose for you based on your previous listening and it's based on algorithms, right? And I looked at the one it was suggesting I listened to the other day, and it was a bunch of bands that I hate. Like, I know them and I hate them. And somehow from, the, from me listening to these other things that I like, it thinks I like that? Like, ugh, yuck. Like, which makes me sad if that is people's avenue of discovery. I suggest you listen to college radio instead. Um, yeah, I just want to double down. I mean, <laughs> college radio really changed my life, and I think it might have to do with like the era. But um, so we talked about that channel fifty-seven. That was really formative. But the second formative thing was discovering um, WPRB um, in Princeton, and uh, John Solomon was here last time. But like my my goal of starting the label of success, or not my goal, my first my, my measure of success was like, will will John Solomon like know what this is? Will I hear it on? college radio, and a lot of what I was doing at the time was geared around getting my record to college radio, specifically to John Solomon, like I would send it to his attention, and which is weird because I actually knew, so, and then because of my love of college radio, I was, I, um, I actually had a show when I was in high school, I went to the station and I was convinced him to give me a graveyard show when I was like way too young to be on the radio, and um, I would actually get in a lot of fights with the music directors because they were, they wanted me to play, um, what they call like the new ads, which I'm sure still exist. And it was, it was basically the, it was probably your titles at the time, yes. like the big indie titles. But I was saying, well, I have you these said like, no. I wanted to play thrash seven. I was saying I have these thrash seven inches by these like local bands. Um, and they're really cool and they're fast. And I would fit like, I would, I would literally, I'll sh I would show you guys the playlist. I would fit like 60 songs into like a two hour radio show. Um, and the show was, it was called Named and Slaughtered was the name of the show. Um, <laughs> Which is a which is a song by it was a it was a cool show and I would have people call from like the local uh, penitentiary and say they were listening and I'd have weird I'd, I really I but it, it was it was like a really big deal and I was like I wonder if someday I'll get I'll do these records and like they'll play these on you know and so I knew John from them but I still was like I don't think he takes me seriously he thinks I'm this like weird ass kid that like comes to the radio station because um, also you could smoke cigarettes um, in, inside of the station back in high school which you couldn't really do a lot of places outside when you were underage because a grown-up would see you and, or someone. But you could go to the college radio station and hang out in the lobby and smoke cigarettes. So there was a lot of like value in college radio for me. <laughs> but, but the goal... The goal was like, but I was like, they don't really take me seriously. They think I'm this weird kid because then when they see a record from Merge, when they see a record from Matador, and they see a record from Sub Pop, they bring it in and they add it. And if I'm like, I got this cool band like that we should play, they're like, yeah, you okay, kid? Like, you know, like why don't you play Clem Snide like you know this week or whatever? I'm trying to, I think that was one of the big bands at the time, like or something like that. Um, and so. It was huge for me when I when I first felt like I actually it was, and it took almost 50, it took almost four or five years in till I actually got I was sending John everything and he was always very complimentary and very helpful and he gave me so much good not just to give me advice of starting the label he actually told me how to do laundry when I was in college like because I didn't know how that worked either but um but I remember there was like a record when I sent it to him and he actually took it he was like the oldest person I knew um and he um. 
he took it seriously and it was like added to the station library and I was like oh it, it, it really felt like real success because I was like I'm now actually reaching the types of people I want to reach because they're like who I how that's how I was reached and it, it, it kind of gives me chills thinking about it. And it's a funny story, but I'm, I'm sitting here kind of like thinking about like that moment. And it's I was, a landmark for you. It really was, and it's uh, but it, it, and I and I still feel that way. And um, so I, I still love college radio, and I think I um, I I wish it still had that same impact on everybody. But I know there's I still it's still if you t go to my car, I have two pre-tuned stations, KDU and PRB, and I usually kind of like kind of flip between them, you know. And um, I'm glad you get PRB here. And um, I like FMU a lot, but I, I, I don't listen to it as much just for whatever reason. Um, but I have those two tuned to my, tuned to my car preset. FMU, I have to change the dial by, by manually, which I will do a lot for certain shows. So. College radio. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, y'all. Well, thank you. Um, come, eat, come eat the food. Come talk to Laura and say hi, and thank you.